you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to get to welcome you to this service of worship here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We know that God is going to meet us in this time today, and so truly there is no better place that we could be. I want to give a special welcome to everyone who is joining us on Facebook Live today. We're so glad that you are here with us as well. If you are new here or newer here, we would love the chance to get to know you and to connect with you. So if you would take a moment and fill out that bright blue and green connect card that is in the pew rack in front of you. You can let us know there how we can be in touch and if you'll just place that in the offering plate uh, later on in the service, that'd be wonderful. I want to let you know that we um, have our next installment of the Healing Connection Lunch Group. That is going to be not tomorrow, but the following Monday. This is for folks who have lost a spouse or a significant other. Um, there's no agenda. It's just a time to be together with other people who've gone through something similar. So that will be next Monday, March 25th at 1130. We're going to be meeting at a different location than usual. We will be at Johnny Luke's restaurant. So if you're planning to go to Olympia, make sure you go to Johnny Luke's instead. Next, uh, next week is going to start off Holy Week for us. And so um, make sure that your calendars are marked for next Sunday for our Palm Sunday Palooza. Um, in addition to celebrating Palm Sunday in worship, we will also have a special fellowship time in between the services where you can come outside to the covered parking lot and get donuts, have some coffee, and most importantly, meet our two special guests Sterling and Sherlock, the donkeys. <laughs> so make sure that you don't miss out on that. And a special note that we will be using the whole covered parking lot for that event. And so we, you won't be able to park there. So uh, you might want to come a few minutes early to uh, make sure that you can adjust your parking spot. After that, we will have a full week of Holy Week events with Maundy Thursday, a Good Friday prayer walk, and of course, um, worship on Easter Sunday. I would invite you to check out the insert in your bulletin for details on all of that. And finally, um, just want to say a heartfelt welcome back to Julia Walker Jewel, our wonderful musician. Um, we are so grateful to have you back. We've missed you these last couple of weeks, and we're grateful to have um, you and your music and gifts back here in worship. That's all of our announcements today. So now I invite you to take a big, deep breath, and let's prepare our hearts for worship. <coughs>
prayer. You can find the words in your bulletin. Let's pray now together. Merciful God, search us and know us. In this season of Lent, grant us courage to take honest stock of ourselves and acknowledge our wrongdoings. Jesus, as we walk with you towards the cross, take away our bent to sinning and teach us how to live. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you now to stand as we join in our opening hymn, number 117, O God, Our Help in Ages Past. Please greet those around you with the peace of Christ. to invite Jay Harris to come forward to share with us our psalm for Lent. Good morning. Today I'll be reading Psalm 130 from the New International Version. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. 
Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is now a special and sacred time in the life of our church when we have the opportunity to practice holy baptism. So I'd like to invite the Phelps family forward. of the baptism in your insert. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty act of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. So now I present any Smith flaps for a Christian baptism. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you? Yes. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you? We do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? Do you? We do. Will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Will you? And do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? And will you nurture one another in the Christian life and include this child now before you in your care? We will. We will. With, With God's, God's help, help we, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with a community of love and forgiveness that she may grow in her service to others. We will pray for her, that she may be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal Father, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. Sing to the Lord all the earth, Tell of God's mercy each day. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Declare his works to the nation, his glory among all the people. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and she who receives it, to wash away her sin and clothe her in righteousness throughout her life, that dying and being raised with Christ, she may share in his final victory. All praise to you, eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit 
lives and reigns forever. Amen. Okay, you can bring Annie forward. Okay. Annie Smith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's lay hands on her. Annie Smith, the Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now it is our joy to welcome our new sister in Christ. Through baptism, you are incorporated by the Holy Spirit into God's new creation and made to share in Christ's royal priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you as a member of the family of Christ. Well, truly, this is an incredibly joyful day here in the life of the church, Um, not only for us in this community, but for the whole universal church, because we now have our newest member in Annie. Today, um, we have made several important promises. The first and the most important promise has been made by God which is that God has promised to love Annie throughout her entire life. No matter what happens, God's love is going to stick and be a seal on her, showing God's care for her. Her parents, Sarah and Michael, have also made a promise that they are going to raise Annie up in the church, in the faith, and that they, through God's grace, are going to lead their lives in a Christian example to be able to teach Annie the way as well. And finally, all of you have made a commitment as well to Annie, that you are going to surround her with a community of love and forgiveness, that you will live as examples of God's love and show her what it means to be a disciple, that you are going to volunteer to be her Sunday school teachers and her confirmation mentor in 12 or so years, and that when she is wiggly or crying in worship, that you are going to look over and smile and tell her that you love her. So truly, we are so grateful to now have the opportunity to welcome Annie into the Church Universal, and Pastor Doug is going to say a prayer for you. Well, we just made a promise that we were going to pray for Annie, so why don't we all lend a hand toward her as we pray for her together. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for Annie's life, and we thank you for the love that you have poured out on her. Lord, through the waters of baptism, you pour out your grace that shows that you will love her no matter what happens in her life. And Father, I thank you so much for her parents, Michael and Sarah, Lord, that um, you have chosen to have the responsibility of raising her up. And Lord, I thank you um, for our church and ask that you will um, help us to surround Annie with a uh, a community of love and forgiveness. And Lord, we pray that not only will she grow up to be uh, happy and healthy, but also faithful um, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Y'all may have a seat. Well, if you'll turn from that insert to the next which is about our new members. And we've got several new members that are about to join us today. Uh, Brian and Laura Basile, if they'll come up now. Bobby and Susan Collins. And Brian and Brittany Rodenheiser. There they are. You see on your sheet that Jeremy and Carrie Roberts were also supposed to join today. Um, Carrie's grandmother is in hospice um, and, um, and she is uh, by her side, and so we want to be in prayer for, um, for Carrie's family at this time. So uh, great to have y'all. Um, welcome, welcome. Um, how many years have you been attending here? Oh. All right, so we're going we're gonna to put you... I've thought about it a lot. You've thought about it a lot. I'm just, I just want to let you know, you, there is not a 20-year prerequisite before joining the church. Okay, if you want to join the church... Um, our next new member class is Saturday, April 13th, and you can sign up on the bulletin board out here in the hallway. All these folks have been worshiping with us and have um, come to that new member class, and so we're glad to um, welcome you officially. They're all already um, Christian. They are part of God's universal church, 
we're inviting them to be a part of Wrightsville United Methodist. So as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, your answer is, I will. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, your answer is, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Church, we give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Welcome. You are our newest members here at Wrightsville. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you. So great to have y'all. Brittany, Brian, absolutely. All right, and so uh, make sure you check out where they're seated so that after the service, you can go up to them and welcome them yourself in a more personal way, introduce yourself, and make them feel at home here at Wrightsville. Y'all are welcome to have a seat. Thank you.
walls come tumbling down. We'll sing and shout till the walls come tumbling down. We'll sing and shout till the walls come tumbling down. We'll sing and shout till the walls come tumbling down. We'll sing and shout till the walls come tumbling down. Thank you so much for this wonderful music. Good morning, church. I'm Eunice Gang, one of the associate pastors. It is my great honor to get to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, thank you for inviting us to worship and praise. Thank you for saving us and making us whole. Thank you for calling us to goodness and grace. We thank you for the gift of this new day to be renewed in your spirit and your words. As you have taught us, we want to fill this day with opportunities to show kindness, compassion, and understanding to one another. Grant us the wisdom to see the humanity in each person we encounter to recognize their dignity as your beloved children. In our interactions with one another, may we be guided by empathy and respect, <coughs> seeking to build bridges of understanding rather than walls of division. May we be vessels of your peace, spreading love and goodwill wherever we go. Help us to listen with open hearts. Give us the strength to put others before ourselves and to treat others as we would wish to be treated. Give us your heart to cry for others and pray for others. So we lift up to you, O oh Lord, those who need your hands and your comfort. We ask your peace for those who are experiencing times of difficulty especially for Israel and Gaza. And now we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our hearts. Lord, hear our prayers. Pour out your strength and your comfort. Touch their lives and souls with your warm hands. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift as we respond to God's generosity and grace. You can contribute to the ministry of Rice Hill United Methodist Church by placing your offerings on the plate 
or using the QR code in the insert. Now, I want to invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. I am a poor wayfaring stranger while traveling through this world below. There is no sickness, toil, nor danger in that bright world to which I go. I'm going there to meet my father. I'm going there no more to roam. I am just going over Jordan. I'm just going over home. I know dark clouds will gather o'er me. I know my pathway is rough and steep. But golden fields lie before me, where weary eyes shall never weep. I'm going there to meet my mother. She said she'd meet me when I come. I am just going over Jordan. I'm just going over. I want to sing salvation story in concert with that blood washed band. I want to wear a crown of glory when I get home to that good land. I'm going there to see my classmates pass before me one by one. I am just going over Jordan I'm just going over home I'll soon be free from every trial this form will rest beneath the sod I'll drop the cross of self-denial and enter in my home with God I'm going there to see my Savior Shed his precious blood for me. I am just going over Jordan. I'm just going over home. I'm just going over home. It is time for a children's message, so if there are any kids, welcome to Cooperate. Today. Good. Good, thank you. So today I have brought my friend Mickey with me. So Mickey, could you please say hi? Hi everyone. Hi. <laughs> so um, Mickey, my friend Mickey, loves to learn about new things, especially about how to be a good friend. But sometimes he gets a little confused. So like how to do that? So today, I want to ask your help. So would you please help him out to learn about how to be a good friend? Yes. Thank you so much. Aww. Thank you. Yeah, OK, Mickey, OK, good. So we're talking about something special called the golden rule. Have you ever heard about golden rule? Yes, and do you know what that means? Yes, would you please say that? Treat others the way what you want to be treated. Perfect, thank you so much, yes. Actually, the golden rules was taught by Jesus Christ. So Jesus taught that, just do to others what you would like them to do to you. So that means if you want someone to be kind to you, you should be kind to them. And if you want someone to share with you, you should share with them as well. 
So it is like treating others the way you want it to be treated. So let me give some examples. Um, if you had a favorite toy and you didn't want anyone to break him, and how would you treat someone else's favorite toy? Kind. Kind, and? Um, good. Good, yes. You would treat someone else's favorite toy very kindly, very um, carefully, just like you want them to treat your favorite toy. And what if you were feeling sad? Yes. Well, huh? Leave them all on, and then take some time, your personal time, right? Yeah. So likewise, good. So likewise, if you see someone else feeling sad, you would um, give some time to them, and then you also could give some hug and talk to them, and also just listen to their stories. So by doing these things, you are following the golden rules. So just Jesus taught us. So this week, let us remember to treat others with kindness and love and listen to their stories. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, good. Miki, are you ready? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so let us ask God to give his wisdom through our prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for giving us important lesson today. Help us to treat others with love and kindness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and thank you for helping me, Key. You can go back to your seat. Pastor and Sue, thank you, Mickey Mouse. Appreciate all the kids coming. Um, I want to know specifically what we're supposed to do in case our team lost last night. How are we supposed to treat others? Um, <laughs> it's great to see everybody. I'm Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Uh, it's good to be able to worship and, um, as we uh, are here on St. Patrick's Day and uh, spring is right around the corner. Um, I got a couple of things before we get started. Um, number one, y'all remember how we got out of um, church early last week? Anybody remember that? Well, um, just keep remembering that. Um, and then uh, secondly, uh, I think there ought to be some sort of dispensation to be able to wear a green stole on the Sunday that lands on St. Patrick's Day, right? You know? Um, so we wear purple during the season of Lent, um, but... Uh, the word Lent itself comes from an ancient Latin word meaning spring, which to me think, makes me think of green. And so I want to wear green today, but I don't get to wear green today because of the rules. And so I play, I'm a rule follower, so we're, we're going to do the purple for the season of Lent. That's far more than you wanted to learn about that. Okay, so um, we're in Genesis chapter 16. Now you're going to see a, a couple of people here in this uh, scripture um, that... Their names are spelled differently than you're used to. Um, they are Sarah and Abraham. In this scripture, they go by the names Sarai and Abram before they got their names changed. But it's the same people as uh, Sarah and Abraham that we know throughout Genesis. So uh, I'm actually just going to read through the first 10 verses. You can read um, the rest of the story on your own. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bore him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife. He went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she ran away from her. 
The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Mighty and everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. You might remember as we began the new year, we started off with a sermon series entitled, Who Am I? Each week, we heard a different sermon about what God originally intended for people. And then as we started the season of Lent, we began to look at how sin messed up what God originally intended. So, for instance, we learned in January that God is our creator and that God created us to be in relationship or communion with him. But in February, we heard the story of the Tower of Babel, where people thought they could get along without God, that they were just as powerful as God, and that they could get to heaven without God. Back in January, we learned that the very first commandment was to take care of the earth. And in March, we learned that God will take care of our needs, just as he did by giving the Hebrew people manna in the wilderness. Nevertheless, the people grumbled when they couldn't have more than what they needed, which shows that part of the human condition is that we want more than our share, and that taking more than our share leads to an abuse of the earth's resources. In January, we learned that God intended for people to work, and that they would find dignity in using their abilities to provide for their families and make the world a better place. And yet last week, we learned that people often make an idol out of their work and place their work ahead of their relationship with God and with others. Today, we're looking at another result of the fact that we live in a fallen world. God intended for us to have meaningful relationships but in today's story, we learn that people sometimes take advantage of others due to their own selfishness. So let's dive in. You may recall that Jesus reduced all the commandments down to just two. We are to love God with all our heart and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now it isn't so hard to love a God who is good and values us highly, However, when we begin to love others as we love ourselves, that's not quite as easy. Some people are just plain hard to love. <laughs> they aren't nearly as good as God, and they sure don't value us as highly as God, who is willing to send his son to die for us. It probably doesn't take you very long to think of a person in your life who is difficult to love. You have that person in your mind? But it may surprise you to know just how much the Bible has to say about difficult relationships. Let's look in on some of the difficult people in the Bible. For if ever there was a family exhibiting difficult behavior, it's the family of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And today we're going to highlight one such story with Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. Which one of the three people in this passage would we describe as the difficult one? A case might be made for all three of them. Abram, Sarai, and Hagar all exhibited difficult behavior at some point in the passage. But it would not be fair to label them all as difficult people. Labeling people as difficult too quickly might be inaccurate. It doesn't allow people a chance to change. It may also cause us to write them off. And we may miss the opportunity to know a wonderful person or to appreciate the good things that they're able to provide either for us or for others. For instance, King David would not be considered a difficult person by most people, but Uriah's family might think otherwise. If you remember the story, David stole Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, and then had Uriah killed. And yet David was extremely popular widely considered Israel's greatest king. The Bible even calls him a man after God's own heart. 
Now, that might be an extreme example, but the fact is all of us exhibit difficult behavior to someone at some time. Let's review today's story to help us understand the problem. Abraham and Sarah have been promised a child by God, but they're getting on up there in age and still no baby. So Sarah decides not to wait on God any longer and instead takes matters into her own hands by saying to her husband, why don't you take my slave girl, Hagar, as your wife, and perhaps we can have an heir through her. Abraham says, okay, because that wasn't that weird back then. (laughs) And sure enough, Hagar becomes pregnant. Instead of celebrating this scheme, working out just as Sarah had imagined, she now gets jealous that Hagar was able to conceive when she was not. So she begins to mistreat Hagar and is so horrible to her that Hagar runs away. While Hagar's running, she stops at a spring for a drink. And there an angel of the Lord sees her and tells her that she needs to go back to her mistress, Sarai. Her reward will be that God will so greatly multiply her offspring that they will not be able to be counted. This is not an easy thing for Hagar to do, but she turns around and goes back home. In this passage, excuse me, passage, Sarah was difficult to Hagar, and Sarah interpreted Hagar's contempt as difficult in return. It all comes down to how you see it. I'm sure Sarai thought Hagar was the difficult one and not herself. On the other hand, it's obvious that Hagar thought Sarai was being the difficult one and she was only the innocent victim. Two people can experience the same event, but they may experience it very differently. This is because we view everything through the filter of our own experiences and we choose the stories we tell ourselves based on the fact, on the very facts that we choose to remember. For instance, in my family growing up, I thought my sister was favored because she was the youngest. She might say that she thought I was always favored by mom and dad. I guess our parents must have done a pretty good job of being fair since we both think the other one was treated uh, better than we were. And I'm sure I'm going to get a text about this uh, later on this afternoon. (laughs) Um, You see, we both experienced the same events, but we perceive them very differently. This is why even Jesus could be viewed by some as a difficult person. He was perfect. But I'm sure the money changers in the temple that he drove out thought he was difficult. And the religious leaders who thought he was blaspheming by healing on the Sabbath may have found him difficult too. It's easy for Sarai to see the difficult behavior exhibited by Hagar, but I doubt she ever saw it in herself. Hagar, on the other hand, saw difficult behavior oozing out of Sarai, but would not have seen her participation in this plan as contributing to the problem. This is why in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus can talk about a person seeing a speck in someone else's eye, but failing to see the log in their own. We judge another person as to whether or not they're difficult by how they treat us. And generally speaking, we don't treat all people the same. So although Abram and Sarai may have said that Hagar was being difficult, I doubt she'd agree. And I'm sure Hagar and Abram's son Ishmael wouldn't agree either. His experience with his mom was probably a very positive one. So his opinion of her is going to be very different from that of Sarai's. In the same way, we usually determine our estimation of a person primarily by our interactions with them. I'm sure Joseph from the Old Testament didn't think that his father Jacob was being difficult when he showed favoritism toward him. Now the other brothers, on the other hand, viewed their father's favoring of Joseph as very difficult. And their decision to sell him reflects the hostility they had toward their brother and their dad. So in preparation for the sermon, I got to thinking, maybe I'm a difficult person. How could I find out? Well, I could go around and start asking people, but I suspect they're going to tell me what I want to hear. Well, the Individual Differences Research Lab actually has a test to determine how difficult you are. The test has 35 questions, and it doesn't take too long, so I gave it a try. I scored in the easy-to-get-along-with zone. Shoo! 
But I did not get an absolute zero on the difficulty scale. I scored a 24 out of 100. And I'm sure there are people in this room, my family, and my staff who wish I would retake the test. <laughs> I scored the lowest or best in the areas of risk-taking and callousness. I scored the highest or worst in the areas of grandiosity and aggressiveness. I'm not so surprised about the grandiosity. After all, I do have an ego. But I was a little surprised about the aggressiveness. The three categories that I scored in the middle on were suspiciousness, manipulation, and domineering. How do you think you would do? There's another test you can take, if you like, from the University of California. It's titled, Am I a Jerk? <laughs> Why would anyone want to take that test? Well, according to Eric Schwitzgable, a professor at the University of Cal Riverside, jerk self-knowledge is hard to come by. It's probably true. Schwitzgable defines a jerk as someone who culpably fails to appreciate the perspectives of others around him, treating them as tools to be manipulated or fools to be dealt with rather than as moral peers. The jerk faces special obstacles to self-knowledge of his moral character, partly because of his disregard of the opinions of people who could give him useful, critical feedback. So, if you're not willing to listen to others who could give you useful, critical feedback, then you might want to take this test to check out what Professor Schwitzgable calls your jerkitude. <laughs> and you can easily find that test online. But instead of the internet or the realm of academics, our primary authority is the Bible. So let's check out some examples of how to deal with difficult people from the Word of God. Number one, believe the best about people. The famous love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13, says, Love believes all things. This does not mean that you have to believe everything you are told, but it means you should believe the best about a person until you absolutely have to believe otherwise. It's placing a good motive behind people's actions or refusing to believe bad things about them until it's absolutely certain. Don't jump to conclusions or suspicions about others. Even if something looks fishy, it is possible the person has a good reason or motive for doing it. For instance, every Methodist minister knows that when it's time to move to a new church, the best place to get moving boxes from is... The liquor store, that's right. <laughs> I've even had a box of books with a, a whiskey brand on the side of it sitting in my office for the last nine years. I don't drink. I just know where to get good boxes. Number two, overcome evil with good from Romans chapter 12. This particular model is seen in many places in the Bible and exemplified by Jesus during his trial. When someone does something hurtful to you, this model says, don't do anything harmful in return, but instead do something good to them. Jesus said even people of the world are good to those who are good to them, but he called his followers to do good to those who do bad things to them. If we don't fight back, the conflict usually goes away. I've told the story before of the church member who threatened me over the phone some 20 years ago. I was nervous around him, but I kept saying hello to him, kept interacting with him at church, would sit across from him at church dinners. I treated his wife and his children very well. And while it didn't happen quickly, eventually he did come around to apologize. Which brings us to number three, the final model. A soft answer turns away wrath, says Proverbs 15. You ever had somebody really get in your face and holler at you? No? Oh, okay. Um, just me, maybe. Uh, this model instructs us not to holler back at them, but instead to stay calm and respond softly. This will often diffuse an explosive person, and then you can deal with the issue in question. However, if you respond in kind, 
the situation will only escalate into a full-scale shouting match or worse. I actually had to use this model recently, and it worked. The person even called back the next day and apologized for their poor behavior. Although I will say, when I saw their name on my phone, I got a little nervous. <laughs> these are not the only ways to respond to difficult people, of course. And in fact, these models may not work with extremely abusive people. Sometimes there are other things we may, to do, we may need to do in addition to these, including ending the relationship altogether. But sometimes you can't do that. You're going to see that difficult coworker at work tomorrow. You're going to see your annoying uncle at Easter. You're going to see that hard-to-get-along-with neighbor today after church. I'm not telling you to be a willing victim of their poor behavior, but as a Christian... There are three behaviors that make us radically different from the rest of the world. And they are one, that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Two, that we even love our enemies. And three, that we forgive those who have hurt us. That's what Jesus said, and that's what Jesus did. May God bless you as you deal with difficult people this week. And may you recognize the difficulty that you might be causing someone else and do unto them as you would have them do unto you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for relationships in our lives, relationships that build us up and don't tear us down. But, Lord, sometimes... There are relationships that are just really difficult. Whether it's through impatience or selfishness or pride. Lord, help us to learn how to deal with others. And may we be the kind of people that are easier to get along with. Lord, help us to love as you love us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our closing hymn is actually found in the faith we sing. Um, the smaller hymnal that's there in your pew rack. We're going to turn to page 2223 and sing the first and last verse of They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. every week during the season of Lent, we've given you some sort of activity to live out in the coming week um, related back to the text and to the sermon. And so uh, this week, obviously, um, one of our challenges is to um, learn how to live with difficult people and to be among difficult people and try not to be a difficult person ourselves, right? Um, to build, As I uh, used to tell the confirmation class, to build people up instead of tear people down. That's what we're about. 
Well, as the song said, they will know we are Christians by our love. So I'm going to invite you to take it a step further. And not only to care for the people that you know, but to show your love as a witness to people you don't know. The waiters and waitresses, your garbage collector, your, your, um, the person who uh, brings your mail, um, the person that checks you out at Harris Teeter if you don't do self-checkout. Um, folks, wherever you go that you're encountering in your daily life, Show some love. Give a little extra tip today. You know, be the kind of person that you would want people to treat you like. And go forth in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.